Daredevil is one of the few mainstream superheroes that is strong in Christian faith, both in the comics and in the Netflix, now Disney Plus live action version. Matt Murdock's relationship with God has always been rocky, but it really comes to a head in season three where Matt blatantly rejects God. Matt doesn't necessarily sway into atheism, but rather he thinks that his perspective of God has been wrong this whole time. I don't hate him. I've just seen his true face is all. To Matt, God is cruel, immoral, and certainly not an all-loving being. He compares his struggling and his suffering to that of Job from the Bible to demonstrate God's cruelty. God punishes his most loyal and faithful servant, Job, taking everything away from him for no other reason than to just win a bet with Satan. As Daredevil puts it, There is a man from the land of Uz. Book of Job. Book of Job. Story of God's perfect servant, Job. Of all God's soldiers, Job, he was the most loyal. I know the story, Matthew. God murdered all ten of his children in cold blood, scorched every inch of Job's land, lashed at his body till his skin was covered in bloody welts. Job would not curse him. You know what I realized? Job was a pussy. And this is usually how the story of Job is presented. God makes a wager with Satan, allowing his most faithful servant to be tortured. This servant does not curse God no matter what. And in the end, God rewards him by giving him a lot more stuff and a whole new family. Job is nothing more than a pawn for God to prove a point to Satan. In this video, we're going to deconstruct the book of Job and determine what is actually happening. Through the lens of Daredevil, we're going to discover a few different things. Firstly, that the story of Job that you've been told is a lie. That Job, while being a good and moral person, had a very distorted view of God from the beginning. And number three, is that God had good reason to allow Job's trials. The videos on this channel are meant for everyone, but this one is a little bit more specifically geared towards Christians or agnostics to help you not be afraid of the book of Job and that the point of Job is actually about a recklessly loving God who will go to great lengths in order to save you. Let's get into it. So let's talk about Job and this wager with Satan. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power, only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. God says, Look at my servant, who is blameless and upright. To which Satan says, If you weren't protecting him, he'd curse you. And what does God say? Do it. Did you catch a wager? God doesn't deny it or say, no, he won't. And I acknowledge this is a small thing. Okay, Holden, well, technically it may not be a wager, but it's still God permitting suffering. Why? God doesn't care nor need to prove himself, least of all to Satan. But what do we constantly hear throughout the Old Testament and the New? That God loves us, that God cares about us, that God cares about Job. So how do we reconcile this? Daredevil has struggled in reconciling differences with God, but at the start of season three, he comes off as almost a completely different man. Matt compares himself to Job due to all of his suffering, despite him feeling as though he's been loyal and faithful to God. I gave my uh, sweat and blood without complaint because I, I too believed I was God's soldier. <laughs> but this isn't the only comparison to Job that Matt could make. And that's something we're gonna be tackling in this video. But Job is so loyal to God. He's a blameless man. Isn't he doing it right? Why would God do this to a loyal follower? And this brings me to my second point, that while Job is a good, righteous, and moral man, he has a distorted view of who God is. This is the second thing that Matt and Job have in common. Matt feels as though he's doing the Lord's work. He's looking out for the little guy. He's self-sacrificing. You could argue he even preaches in a way to the Punisher in one of the best TV show episodes of anything ever in season two. I live in the real world yeah. too and I've seen it. What have you seen? Redemption, Frank. No. It's real it's and it's possible. He is so like Job. What is the problem? Well, let's look at scripture. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job 
and that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. He would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of his children. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did regularly. At a superficial level, it's easy to look at this and say, See? Job is a faithful and good person. And this is something you need to take note of, whether you're a religious person or not. And that is that being a good or moral person does not equal following God. Compare that description of Job versus the description of Noah in the Bible. Noah, also Old Testament, also known for being exceedingly righteous, especially among a whole lot of wickedness. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. Job and Noah were both good men that feared the Lord, but only Noah is given the distinction of walking with God. Why? Because every description of Job is Job working to earn God's favor. He's following all the rules, he's checking all the boxes, but he's not walking with God. Job is closer in this sense to a Pharisee than an apostle. He's doing good, but he believes he's earning God's favor. Regarding another Old Testament figure, the Apostle Paul writes, For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about or to brag about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. A lot of people claim to follow God, claim to be righteous for God in the same way that Job does. They're going to church, they're saying their prayers, they're not saying any bad words, they're loving their neighbors, but they're not walking with God. Daredevil is a good Catholic boy. He's doing his sacraments, he's doing his penance, he's praying the rosary, he actively partakes in the Eucharist, he asks tough questions, especially so that he can grow into a stronger Christian, even as a child. And he's serving the most vulnerable people in New York, both as the attorney Matt Murdock and as the devil of Hell's Kitchen. He's doing everything right, but he's not walking with God. Jesus gives a very profound warning about this very issue in the New Testament. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Jesus, did we not do all of these things for you? And how does Jesus respond? I never what? I never knew you. Job says, wasn't I a good man? Wasn't I righteous? Didn't I offer all these sacrifices for my children? Wasn't I blameless? Didn't I, didn't I, didn't I? And it's the same thing with Matt. Didn't I stop Fisk? Didn't I preach to punish her? Didn't I sacrifice so much? Didn't I, didn't I, didn't I? As we continue to read Job, this trait of Job becomes so much more clear. After hearing about the death of his children, Let's look at how Job reacts. Then Job arose, tore his robe, and shaved his head, and he fell on the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I come from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all of this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. Now I'm going to be frank with you. If my children died, I would not react like this. And I love God. But there's no way I'd be like, well, the Lord gives and the Lord taketh away. I would react probably closer to how Jesus did when he was on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I would be talking to God. But that's not what Job is doing. He continues to do works. He falls on the ground. He worships and he talks about God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And Job refuses to blame God for doing anything wrong. But why? To continue trying to appease God, not because that's how he really felt. This is made clearer in the second chapter, where Satan gives him boils and takes his health away. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God? And shall we not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Job's wife says, look at all this stuff going on. God doesn't care about you, curse him and die. To which Job says, look, you want good things to happen? We have to accept them from God. Job has a distorted view of God and it's this. A good God plus good works equals 
a good life. If Job does what he's supposed to do, then God is supposed to do what he's supposed to do. Give Job a good life, give him monetary possessions, and make his life easy. Job really is succumbing to something that we referred today, it's not exact, but you'll get the idea, what we refer today as the prosperity gospel. In Job's experience, though, this has always been the case and was ultimately Satan's main point. He's been a good man and he's led a good life, therefore, he's been rewarded with goodness. Job is closer to a televangelist, like God saying, have you considered my servant Kenneth Copeland? He preaches all over the world. He fears God and he's got the riches to prove it. Right. And get in an air, get in a long tube with a bunch of demons. Right. That's exactly the And it, it's deadly. And he tells his followers that if they love God as much as he does, then they too will be blessed financially. Now, something interesting happens to Job at the end of chapter 2. In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Now, that's an interesting distinction. Instead of just saying, in all of this, Job did not sin. What is this implying? It's implying that Job is feeling some kind of way about God, but he's just not admitting it. He's not saying it. Because if he says it, it'll mess up the formula. Good God, good works equals a good life. He's biting his tongue. And Job's friends are of the same mindset. Yeah, Job, you must have done something wrong. Like Jesse Duplantis telling Kenneth Copeland, you must have upset the Almighty if you can't afford a new airplane. You're moving, but no longer by your power. See? That's what the DVD is about. Job surrounds himself with like-minded people who also hold on to this Old Testament prosperity gospel and talk to him accordingly. If the formula is not working, well then clearly you did something wrong. If God isn't giving you what you want, then you messed up. If the cosmic genie isn't granting your wishes, well then, the only possible solution is that you've upset him. And so this is why Job is trying to appease God by worshiping him, by chastising his wife for suggesting that he curse his name, by blessing God's name instead and not charging God with wrong, not because of how he really feels, but because to Job, God is just a means to an end. A good God plus cursing his name equals a bad life. In all of this, Job is trying to earn back God's favor. This is where Matt has been several times before. Throughout the series, Matt feels as though he keeps trying to do good, and yet he gets kicked down for it. And in season three, it comes to a head where, you know what? He just washes his hands clean of God anyway. In front of this God. I'd rather die as the devil and live as Matt Murdock. I'm tired of trying to earn your favor. If you're not going to give me what I want, then I'm done with you. But for Job, after days and days of this, he realizes that the formula isn't working. Only after his initial reactions and realizing that he can't get back on track does he begin to talk to God directly. And what does he say to God? He begins listing off all of his actions, the entire. 31st chapter of Job is just Job listing off what a good man that he is. By all accounts, Job is a blameless man, as the first chapter of Job claims. And hear me on this, that is the problem. Nothing he lists off indicates his faith or trust in God. Job has faith in his own works, not God. This demonstrates a consistent message from the Old Testament all throughout the New, that salvation is based on our faith and trust in God not our works. And how appropriate that Job is arguably the oldest book in the Bible, predating possibly even Genesis. And that this book would contain the same message that we find throughout all of Scripture, all the way to the end of Revelation. That you can't earn it. For by grace you have been saved through faith. That not of yourselves. It is a gift, a gift of God, not as a result of works so that no one may boast, so that nobody can brag about it. In accordance with Job's prosperity understanding of God, he falls into a pit known as moralism. Moralism is the belief that one can earn God's grace through moral works, the opposite of hedonism, which is the rejection of God in pursuit of worldly pleasures. The moralist usually points fingers at the hedonist and says, you're what's wrong with the world. If only you were disciplined and followed God like I do, then the world would be a better place. And the hedonist says, it's your fault the world is the way that it is. If you would let go of your stringent morality and just enjoy the carnal pleasures of life, then the world would be a better place. And then the scripture says that they're both at fault, but actually gives a greater warning for the moralist 
over the hedonist. This is really surprising for a lot of people because they feel as though, well, at least the moralist is attempting to do good, but the hedonist can more clearly see their mistakes down the end of the line because hedonism will eventually lead to despair. And those in despair can often look up at God and find their way back to him. The moralist can be so enshrined in their self-righteousness and their own good deeds that they imprison and blind themselves. C.S. Lewis writes, Prostitutes are in no danger of finding their present life so satisfactory that they cannot turn to God. The proud, the avaricious, the self-righteous are in that danger. Jesus gives a parable in Luke chapter 18 of two men who went into a temple to pray, a Pharisee who was like a religious leader at the time, and a tax collector who, culturally speaking, was viewed as like less than pond scum. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And then Jesus says, I tell you, this man went down to the house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. I see so many Christians fall into this Pharisee moralist trap. Thank God I'm not like those merry worshiping Catholics. Thank God I'm not like those hippy dippy tongue speaking Pentecostals. Thank God I'm not like those drug addicts on the streets or so full of pride like some of these online atheists I run into. Even if I don't have it all right, at least I have it more right than they do. God surely favors me more. God, thank you for making me better than all those others. Be very careful. Let's take a look at the prodigal son. The prodigal son wastes his inheritance, he blows all of his money, and fills his desires with alcohol and prostitutes, and he's left eating out of pig troughs before he humbles himself and returns to his father. The prodigal son is not a story about just the one prodigal son. It's a story about two. When the prodigal son returns, his father is elated, and he has his servants get a banquet together, and they have a huge celebration, but his brother, is dissatisfied over this. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, look these many years I have served you and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him? And he said to him, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Look at how the prodigal son's brother responds. Father, look at all I have done. I do everything right. But your other son who defiles your property with prostitutes, you bestow on him the greatest honor? This isn't fair. What makes the moralist so damned and even more in danger than the hedonist is that they don't acknowledge that they too are prodigal. I'm not gonna sit here and tell you I know the reasons for your suffering in your particular life, but it's dishonest for us to view suffering as some kind of divine punishment. A lot of atheists will point to suffering as an example of God's indifference towards us, if he even exists. But part of being in a fallen world, a world that has rejected God, is that chaos fills that void. In this sense, suffering is a natural consequence of us being separated from God and something that happens to the just and the unjust, as Jesus Christ himself points out. But it drives us to re-examine our lives and our priorities, as Matt Murdock clearly does. Suffering creates empathy, or at least it should if you aren't completely self-absorbed. It's always easier to hear the wisdom and feel the comforts from people who have experienced what you've experienced. It moves us to act spiritually and gets us out of complacency. It will make you lean on God more and trust in Him if you will let it. The anxious person says, what if this happens? What if that happens? What if, what if? A person secure in trusting God says, even if. Even if this happens, I trust in you. Even if that happens, I trust in you. Even if I lose my job. Even if my spouse walks out on my marriage. Even if 
I trust in you. I love you, Lord. You are my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my savior. My God is my rock in whom I find protection. He is my shield, the power that saves me, and my place of safety. Daredevil is right. He's like Job, just not in the way that he thinks. They both share the same fault that neither of them says, even if I don't get what I want, even if things don't go my way, even if I don't understand, I will trust in you. Job's moralism nearly cost him his salvation. God permitted Job's suffering for Job to realize just how far off he was. He was just as prodigal as a hedonist, just as lost as a non-believer, and it took all of this for Job to finally get it. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Job repents of his arrogance and his self-righteousness and finally realizes that not all suffering is divine punishment. God loved Job so much, he was unwilling to spend an eternity separate from him. Which brings me to another point, that from the Christian perspective, all suffering, all of it, is temporary. One thing that I really struggled with in my understanding of Job is Job losing his children and his wife. In the end, Job does get rewarded and he has another wife and he does have more children, but children and wives aren't commodities. In Job's case, it's clear early on that his household is one that does give reverence to God. So it's not a huge step in thinking that Job's children could have also followed God, maybe even more effectively than Job. Even Job's first wife in telling Job to just curse God and die was at least more honest than Job's response, which was just Job trying to appease God, but really stuffing down how he actually feels. From the Christian perspective, the story doesn't just end with Job's children and wife being dead and him starting over, but that eventually Job would be reunited with all of his family in the end. The promise of everlasting life. This is the hope that all Christians have and that unfortunately atheists don't get to share in. Of course, from the atheist worldview, these deaths are just the most evil thing that could happen because to the atheists, Death is where it ends. Job's children die and they're gone. God, in permitting Job's suffering, knows that Job will be reunited with them again forever. Our hope in Christ, the promise of everlasting life in communion with God, reminds us that death is not the end. That we serve the God of the living. That while suffering is an inevitable part of your Christian faith, hold on to the faith. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed perplexed but not driven to despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed. One of the most important things in an area that Job's friends failed miserably in is carrying each other's burdens. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. The church, the body of believers, is a place with the intention of helping to relieve suffering. When a Christian hurts, we lift them up. When a Christian is down and struggling, we encourage them, just as the priest does for Matt. The irony about the story of Job is that it's usually told from this perspective that God uses mankind as a pawn to prove a point to Satan, when in reality, God uses Satan as a pawn in order to save Job. Keep your suffering in perspective. I don't make this point to belittle your struggles because I do believe that God cares about your problems no matter how big or small they are, but you may be missing opportunities to practice thanksgiving. For example, I hate getting stuck in traffic. It's one of the few times I feel the Holy Spirit just leave my body. I'm just kidding, relax. But I have been in bumper to bumper traffic just fuming over how ridiculous this is. Don't these people know how to drive? Don't they know I have places to be? 30 minutes later, I see a horrific car crash in front of me. I'm not sure it's possible if everyone survived that. Here I am complaining about being inconvenienced in my air conditioned car. And these people, my neighbors, are experiencing possibly one of the most horrific events of their lives. That those people would probably do anything to trade places with me. And yet I'm complaining, why God? Keep suffering in perspective. The last thing to keep in mind in regards to suffering is that the finish line is always invisible. You can never see it. But take some examples in your own life of periods of time where you went through suffering, but you came out the other end. If you knew the ultimate resolution, how would that have affected how you dealt with suffering in the moment? What would it take for you to trust that God has your back despite the suffering in your life? When will your mindset change from what if, what if, to even if, even if? How much more do you need to go through in order for you to get that? 
Matt Murdock's journey is so relatable to me in so many different ways because, at least in this instance, it reminds me of when I was a more arrogant Christian. Arrogant in my own knowledge and in my own practice, where I thought, thank you God that I'm not like those people or like those believers. I know better and I act like it. Thank you God for correcting me, for disciplining me, for humbling me, for having mercy on me, a sinner. How much more does Matt Murdock need to experience for him to get it? He's been shot in the head, a building has collapsed on him, his hearing is restored, his friends are loyal despite him constantly turning his back on them, despite constantly taking advantage of them. He is fed and clothed by people he consistently insults. He insults God and mocks the gifts that he has all while waving his finger at his heavenly father and disowning him. And the thing about fathers, good fathers anyway, as God is, is that despite all of that, the door is always open. And while Matt Murdock may be miles away from God right now, blowing his inheritance, his father waits patiently for the prodigal son to return so that he can welcome him with open arms and have a celebration. You were lost, but now you're found. You are dead, but now alive. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate it a lot, and I'll catch you in the next video. God bless.